back to the And God Said podcast. As you know, I'm your host, Reverend Kimberly Constant, and we are finishing up a series of lectures, short little lectures, on the book of Psalms. So if you haven't already, this is the last of six lectures. Go back and listen or watch the other ones, especially the first one, which will set the scene for you as well as explain the unique uh unique book of the Psalter and the unique way in which we're approaching it. This is these lectures are not quite like anything we've had so far, and they it, they will be distinct among all the lectures you're going to get in this series. So uh, again, just make sure you go and listen to the first Psalms. So we're wrapping up our time in the Psalter with a look at the Psalms of Thanksgiving and Praise. And so I have titled this lecture, Praise. So both of these types of psalm offer typically joyous worship to God. Now this is the Psalms, it's the Psalter. So sometimes there's still elements of lament and or, you know, cursing of the enemies present. But where it is, it's typically something that has happened in the past. And then the person is thanking or praising God for an answer to what had transpired. Uh, But for the most part, there's just a lot of joy in these psalms. So some components that you would find in a praise psalm, there's usually a call to worship, a description of God's acts and attributes, and then some kind of conclusion in which the psalmist calls us all to praise or calls us to obey God. So the psalms I want to look at today are Psalm 103, and then a group of psalms called the Hallel Psalms, and then a final word kind of wrapping up the Psalter for us. So let me skip ahead here to Psalm 103. So this is a praise psalm of David. And as one scholar wrote, and I heartily agree, it should be counted amongst the greatest works of art or contributions to humanity. It is a gorgeous psalm, practically perfect in every way. It's personal and yet it's applicable to men and women of faith all through the ages. And it begins with a personal reflection, as is often true of the best psalms and hymns. And in this case, it seems that the psalmist has been rescued from some terrible malady. So remember what I said, sometimes you'll see an element of lament, but typically it's something that happened in the past. And so in this instance, the psalmist believes his life has been redeemed from a place called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. That was what they called the afterlife. They did not have a well-developed understanding of the afterlife. The revelation of having life after death and having abundant life and being known and and dining with God in heaven, that is all going to come in Jesus Christ. And so they have not met him yet in these Old Testament times. And so their idea of the afterlife was just kind of this nebulous place where your soul went to rest with your forefathers. And, uh, you know, it's neither bad nor good. It's just kind of like rest. And they don't really get much beyond that. So for that, for what it's worth, the psalmist feels like his life has been redeemed from that. Uh, But he also recalls God's actions in history. So he turns from personal to kind of an overarching view of what God has done for Israel. So God has rescued him personally, but he's also recognizing God has rescued all of the people. Uh, So he remembers deliverances from times past, the exodus, the formation of Israel, and the entry into the promised lands. And then for us, if we're praying this psalm, we would then skip forward to also remember what God did for us in Jesus uh, through his, his death, his ministry, his birth even, and his death ministry. I'm going out of order. Birth, ministry, death, and resurrection. And then finally, the psalmist reflects on these acts of deliverance, both personal and corporate, as testaments to the character of God. God is compassionate, merciful, loving, faithful, sovereign. And thus, God is deserving of praise. As the psalmist puts it, from humans, from angels, and from everything God has created. And yes, even from the very soul of the psalmist. So ending back to a personal note. Just chef's kiss. It's a work of art, and we are going to pray through it. But I want to talk about another category of psalms called the halal psalms. So In the last lecture, we talked about the Psalms of Ascent, which were sung by pilgrims who had to travel from far off places to Jerusalem for feasts or festivals. 
this particular set of psalms is used within the city um, during the, especially during something like Passover. So it's not just for the pilgrims journeying to the city. This is for everyone that has gathered together to celebrate the festival. Uh, so many scholars believe Jesus and his disciples would have sung these psalms at the, at the conclusion of the Last Supper as they made their way um, out of, you know, their Passover meal. So Psalms 113 and 114 in this group praise God's tr transcendence and imminence and his deliverance, again, as seen in the event of Exodus. Psalms 115 through 116 focus on the act of praise, which is our response to the transcendence and imminence of God. It is also a psalm of thanksgiving for personal deliverance. So much like Psalm 103, which we're going to pray through. And then Psalms 117 through 18, praise God himself, who is worthy of praise and who is loving and faithful. So just an interesting little group of songs. And then just read those and think of Jesus himself singing those words. And then I just want to wrap us up uh, with a little word about the entirety of the book of Psalms. So as we learned in the beginning lecture, the psalm starts off with a call to make a choice. Will we follow the way of the righteous or will we follow the way of the wicked? And in fact, the entirety of the Psalter continually calls us to choose uh, a path of obedience and humility and following God or the path of self-fulfillment, pride and following our own truth. Spoiler alert, <laughs> we are told that true happiness is found in following God, although that's not really a spoiler alert if you've studied some of these psalms this week. Um, so the Psalter explores the highs and lows and in-betweens of human existence. And as I said in the beginning, it is loosely organized according to the unraveling and then the rebuilding of God's people Israel. So we follow sort of loosely in the first three books of the Psal Psalter their downfall and when they trusted too much in human kings, they did whatever they wanted, and it resulted in disaster and an exile from the promised land. But then we also follow their rising in the fourth and fifth books. When God brings them back, he helps them to rebuild and restore Jerusalem and themselves as God's people. And he begins to put into their hearts and minds the hope of a Messiah who would come and offer full redemption and restoration of Israel. And the Psalter, of course, ends with praise, just pure praise. The final psalms in the Psalter are just praise, praise, and more praise. And they recognize that no matter what is going on, God's love is always with us. God is for us. We matter. And God does see and care and respond to us. And so we praise whether or not God gives us what we want or he seems to not give us what he wants, whether or not we feel God's presence or we don't feel God's presence in a certain moment, we know and trust that God is with us, that God loves us, and that we matter. And that is enough. God is enough. And so we praise. And we have hope always. And one day we will all be together singing a truly new song in paradise forever and ever. Amen. So before I go, I do want to pray through Psalm 103 with you, this praise Psalm of David. And this one, I'm not going to make too many changes to, because like I said, it really is just a beautiful work of poetry. So let us pray. Praise the Lord, my soul. May all my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all of our sins. He heals all our diseases. He redeems our lives from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion. God satisfies our desires with good things and our youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Indeed, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, is as far as God has removed our transgressions from us. 
Indeed, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For God knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. And then the wind blows over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts, and with those who follow the feet of Jesus. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding and obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, every single part of creation everywhere in his dominion. And finally, praise the Lord, my soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.